At the end of the day, success is about having freedom and choice, not about anyone else, whether it be a client or an employer or a wife or anyone else telling us what to do. We should get to choose to do it because we want to do it. So you and I met, of course, on Clubhouse because you're like Mr. Clubhouse. You're Mr. Clubhouse creator. You you jumped on the app, uh, uh, what, Christmas Eve? Yeah. And so for those who don't know too much about Clubhouse, I mean, it's a social media experiment almost. It's like this audio app. Uh, but but P, there's so many early adopters. I didn't get on until February. I feel like I'm super late. You got into <laughs> December. You're like, you're like, oh, gee, you're only like six weeks ahead of me. And yet it was everything. How did that happen? That this, that this little window of time made all of this massive difference for growth and everything else? It's, it's wild what happened, Mark. Um, you know, when I came in on the 24th of December, I, I wasn't impressed. I, I popped in and I just left. And I came back in a couple of days later and I got into a room that was all about answering questions. And it was a time that a lot of marketers started to come into the app. So, you know, I've been in like War Room and Jeff Walker's Mastermind and Kevin Nations. Like I've been in all these groups. So I knew a good bit of people in the real world. So I was on stage and I started to see all my friends coming in. So it was like, oh, well, these are my friends like Joshua B. Lee or, oh, here's my friend, this person or that person. And then... I started to meet a few new friends and I just started showing up and it was like, Oh, I'm just hanging out with my friends today. <laughs> I didn't have that much going on, but it was like, it's like me and you, like we're hanging out, we're on the street corner and there's just people stopping by asking pretty intellectual questions. We get to answer their questions and help them and serve them. And then they start messaging saying like, I'd like to pay you some money. I'd like to have a little bit more help. And, and it just started to flow. And I was like, Holy wow, there's an opportunity right here. Well, it was like nothing and, I'd ever seen. And so this is crazy. So, I mean, I've learned a little bit about your backstory. I can't wait to get into some of the, the hard times that you faced. But, I mean, you're, you've are you been in marketing for a long time. So when you say, hey, there's an opportunity here, I mean, you, you know, we all talk about zone of genius. We all talk about God-given gifts and skill sets and everything. But, like, spotting opportunities, that's kind of like your bag, isn't it? Yeah, it's, you know… I, I've tried to pinpoint, and I think we, as an entrepreneur, we always evolve, right? What do we do? What do we do? How do we help people? And we realize we're like, oh, we help this person do this, and then we help that person do that. And as I've learned, it is those money opportunities. You know, I focus on opportunity. I focus on money. But every client, that's a straight lace for me. So I guess it is kind of the magic sauce that I've, I've learned that I have, is there's a lot of things I'm really horrible at, but finding <laughs> money and finding those little opportunities. It's just something that, you know, whether it's, it was Jeff Walker or Michael Hyatt, or it doesn't matter. There's, those are those little moments that light me up the most. Yeah. And I mean, there's been big, there's, there's big names. I, I've been, I've heard a, a few of your streams. Um, I didn't have time when you were running your 24 hour stream and you're like, I help this person, this person, like <laughs> we're talking about big names that everyone knows. Lewis Howe is in big teams and big names, but so, so I, 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 I want to talk to you mostly actually about the courage that I think that you had to walk away from some of these big names. I want to talk about the creator economy that exists and the courage you have to pursue these things when you don't know how they're going to turn out. But before any of that, um, I don't, I don't, I, I struggled, you know, this is, this is what's amazing about people doing the most amazing things. Often they don't have the profile or the background where I can just go and research them and go like, oh, you know, you, you, you grew up, I mean, I assume you grew up in Carolina because you talk about it a lot, but oh, you grew up here and you did this and this happened and this is your life. Like, I don't have any of those bios. So before you broke onto the scene in terms of just being like a marketing strategist that all the big names wanted to work with, I mean, I don't know anything about your background. <laughs> where did you come from? How did you emerge yeah. as this leader? Um. No, great question. I don't have a lot of that build out. It's a big weakness of mine, in all honesty. But I grew up in Southern West Virginia. Southern and West Virginia. Southern Just West Virginia. Fancy Gap. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I grew up in this little town called Oceana. Okay. Little bitty town in Southern West Virginia. There's actually actually a documentary about my town that won a bunch of awards called Oxiana because it was a big oxycodone pandemic there. Okay. Like so this horrible, is we're talking about horrible. like Mountain Dew, West Virginia kind of thing. 100%. Like okay. 
horrible area. Like I grew up in a town with no black people. I also okay. grew up in a town with no stoplights. I was an hour away from Walmart, an hour away from the movie theater. So it just my life. Now at 17, I moved to South Carolina and we moved to Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. But the first 16 years of my life, I spent in like farmland, Illinois and Southern West Virginia. And I got into computers and got involved in tech. At one point in time, I had some root access to Indiana University that I wasn't supposed to have. Um, <laughs> so I didn't, I didn't really know what I was doing, but I knew enough about what I was doing to to get myself in there. But I, I wasn't like I wasn't that savvy enough to like really know what I was doing. But. I went to college and I was bored. Like school was always super boring to me, right? It was like, it wasn't challenging. I remember like, I got a C in typing, <laughs> but I made an A on the final and an A on the prelim because they gave us the final the first day. I didn't do any of the work in the middle because I didn't need to do the work. I already made an A the first day. Yeah. So why do I need to do the work to learn how to make an A on the last day? I already did it. You sound like my oldest son. <laughs> so it, it, it was just boring to me. But when I, when I went to college, I, I went to Coastal Carolina University in Myrtle Beach, and I lived in like the girls' dorm most of my first semester. I'm not a girl. Um, I wasn't, I did not identify as a girl then either. I just kind of hung out and lived. And then I went to college at Charleston and I lived in the dorms for the first semester. And then I started the second semester and I dropped out. Now my mom was a school teacher. So I was kind of considered like, now I was gonna be the failure, right? Like yeah. you dropped out of school, like you're going to be a failure. And I said, oh, I'm going to get a job in computers. And I did. I got a job working for a company, an what, ad agency. What year is this? 2000 to 2001. Okay. So, Way so, back in the so day. Right before the crash of the dot com as well. Yeah, I remember, like, I remember 9-11 yeah. because I was in a closet that I worked in and I ran home to put the VCR tape in the, the VCR to record what was happening on television. Yeah, I was in my final, you're just a little bit older than me, I think, then. I was in my final year of high school. Uh, up here in Canada, we had five years of high school. So okay. so the fifth year was was uh, to get into university. Gotcha. Um, I didn't end up going to university because I thought I didn't want to write, write papers. Um, but, uh, but yeah, man. So, okay, so it's 2000. <laughs> and I, I worked working at an year. ad agency. <laughs> for one year. One year I did it. I... I wrote the software to determine at the ad agency, they build off of estimates, but yep. they didn't actually know what it costs to produce the product. Yes, like every ad agency ever, you, you put together an hour count for your estimates, you sign the, this, the statement of work or whatever based on those estimates, and then it's just too much time to have time tracking back then, so you just hope that it was profitable. Yep, so I wrote the in-house software to track the entire company. Okay. And we were the largest print house in the Carolinas. So big print house, big agency doing millions of dollars in billings. I'm like 19, 20 years old. My boss tore his ACL playing men's league softball. I had never had a developer job in my life. I was using a piece of software called FileMaker Pro, which was a database software back in the day. And I wrote this whole software and it was all touchscreen on IMAX. So I built kiosks all through the plant to track what everyone did. Hmm. And I completed three years worth of work in one year. And I went into my annual Why? review. Why? Were you, you were. I just did it. Were, they had a three year or... plan. I, I just did it. Like, I mean, literally they put me in this closet, like a closet, I had no windows and I just shut the door and just coded. <laughs> and then I was like, well, I should take some college classes and learn how to code. So I took like that same year, I took a level one, a level two and a level three, like a 101, a 201 and a 301. Yeah. Like the 101 said, don't come back. The 201, maybe take a final. The 301, I learned a few things at, but it was like, I was doing this. I just needed to figure it out. So I just so, worked. So is this like, um, a quirk, a gift, or like a mental health issue, like that you're. Um, so I, I have a I have a very clear um, bill of mental health. I, I went through a, a rather nasty divorce, and I had to go through that full forensic psyche vow. And I am clean. I have a clean mental health um, bill there, so I know that that's pretty recent. Um, but I just like I like to figure stuff out. Mm. I like to get to the bottom of it, and I I have a problem, I guess, just in. I can't let it take longer than it needs to take. 
So if I can, like, I didn't write my plan before I was hired. They wrote a plan. The boss wrote a plan and pitched to the company. Let's hire a young developer. Let's pay them 20 grand a year. And let's let them, like, let's turn them loose. It'll take us about three years. So we'll have about 60 grand in this. And we'll have a great piece of software. But instead, you delivered it for 20 grand. (laughs) Right. So I go into my annual review. I've never been in one of these. So... They said, we're going to give you a massive raise. Well, I just calculated. I mean, pretty good at math. I expected about, I was going to make like 45 grand. They said, we'll give you 10%. You now make $22,000 a year. Wow. <laughs> and I resigned on the spot. I, I told them I would document my software and I was going to be done. And I, I was, and, and I spent, since then I've spent two, about two years working for someone else. The rest of the time I've, I've worked for myself. You know, this is, what, this is so interesting to me because, you know, I was in, I was in one of your rooms on clubhouse, maybe two months ago, I think it was a Sunday morning room. You run your rooms at seven 30. I don't know if you still do them or not, but it was Sunday morning room. I jumped in, I asked you a question, um, which was actually why I wanted to have you on this podcast because you shared some of your story. I asked you a question. You gave a lot of insight. Um, and I was just saying to my wife the other day, my wife and I would go for a walk every day at 4 p.m. I was saying, you know what? It never even crossed my mind that if things go sideways, I could go get a job. Like, like I started my company when I was 23 years old. I've been running for 15. I'm 38 now. I've been in ups. I've been in downs. I have generalized anxiety disorder. So I have like anxiety. I, I have insecurities. Last night I couldn't sleep. It was 2 a.m. and I'm feeling terrible. And the thought never crossed my mind that I could go out and get a job. Like, like it's so interesting to me that, that for me, I can easily consider losing everything, going bankrupt, losing everything. But the thought of getting a job never crossed my mind. Like, so you've had a job twice <laughs> in I, your I whole career. It, yeah, I did it twice because, well, so I had an angel investor. So I had this gentleman, he owned a company called Silkrete. They did water-based stucco and concrete sealer. And he invested in my first agency. When I quit my job, I really didn't have a plan. Mm. And he handed me a check and said, here you go. What I became though. How, how does that happen? So, so this is what inspired me two months ago when I said, like, even you just saying, when I quit my job, I didn't have a plan, you yep. know? And, and, you know, when I left working with Lewis Howes, I just freed up space. And when I moved to Puerto Rico, I freed up space. And when this and then when this happened, I freed up space. And then it left me room for all these opportunities. I go, I go, how the hell does this guy do it? <laughs> like, like, like how looking back, you could connect all these dots, but how the hell do you have the courage to be like, I'm just gonna do it? And and then this guy gave I had an angel investor, he gave me money and he was like, How? How how do you have that? How does that how does that proven to work for you time and time again? I think it's just faith in something good's going to happen if you give it space to happen. Like, and I really do. I just think it will. Like, I'd met this guy. And I mean, this was, I'll give you a little funny story. So we had controlling interest of a misspell of eBay and Hotmail. Okay. So. <laughs> so On the URL, like, you mean? The URL. Back in like 2000, I was the big spammer. Okay. So, but I was an ethical spammer. When you emailed someone at Hotmail, H-O-T-M-A-I-L, but you typoed it I-A-L, which a lot of people do. Yes. I received your email. (laughs) Yes. Do you remember, do you know Perry Marshall? Do you remember Perry Marshall? (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was at a conference in 2005 that I was producing um, and Perry Marshall was the keynote. And I remember him laughing about SEO and spammers. And I remember him, I, I, I remember this on footage, him literally saying, uh, a spammer was recently assassinated. <laughs> he spent so much, he said so much spam that he was assassinated for sending that much spam. So for those who are younger, you may not realize how, how annoying spam used to really be compared to now your social media gets hacked and things like that. But spam was a thing. You were the spammer for Hotmail. Awesome. But I was a bit ethical about it because what I did though is I took the original email, right? I corrected your typo for you. I sent the original email to everyone you wanted to receive your original email. So I actually delivered it for you, but I grabbed everybody's emails in the process. (laughs) I hope the statute of limitations is passed. Otherwise the FBI is listening, right? Well, no, it's, it's, there's nothing wrong with it, right? Like that was allowed. We didn't have a canned spam act back then. 
Ah, okay. This was before there were laws around like spamming. There's no privacy laws back in 2000 on the internet. Yeah. Like this was the wild west. Yeah. So like I did that. We also had controlling interest of EABY.com. Mm. And we did a bunch of affiliate stuff there. So we had some fun like and I just always believe like there's an opportunity, there's a chance. There's mm. if I if I step into something, if I ask the right question, somebody will say yes. If I pitch the right idea, then somebody's going to say yes. I shoot my shot like I shoot my shot like nobody's business. Like when I I told you I worked for like two years. One of those years, I was the vice president of a sports marketing firm. <laughs> now, vice of course, president, of course you were. <laughs> and um, my 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 job in that one year is I took the company to over six thousand campers because we ran football camps. And I produced a nationally televised high school all-star football game and recruited Cam Newton, to, and he became my MVP of that game. That was my one year in sports marketing. Gary, but, but here's, <laughs> here's the thing. We can go through, I mean, because I have done some research, so we can go through like, you know, you, ran, you did this company for a year, you did this, um, you, you tried to become a speaker at a large event, uh, you can't yeah. become a speaker at a large event, so you decide you're going to run your own event, and then that event goes bankrupt, and then you have these people over, and then you're now here, and you're pitching these people, and you're pitching these people, and you're saying, don't, you know, don't, don't hire an agency and then have to have them figure it out. Hire me, and I'll, I already know it all. Like, it's almost like when you say it's Wild West in 2000, you live in the Wild West. Like you thrive in the Wild West. That's like your zone. I try to do something. Well, I like to innovate and I like to bring things into an area that no one's seen them. Most of what I'm doing is just reproducing other models I've seen work in other industries. Okay, because I was going to actually ask that. I was going to ask how you can pitch confidently with uncertainty of outcome, how you can pitch confidently um, or even as ballsy as you have time after time after time when what you're pitching is on the cutting, not even on the cutting edge, it's, it's you are unsure if it can be accomplished. And yet it seems well, to I know be. it so can either... be accomplished. I okay. know it can be accomplished. I'm just unsure how to accomplish it. Okay. So I always know it can be accomplished. Like I know we can win something. I just have to figure out how, like the technology, I have to figure it out, how to make it happen. But I know it'll work because it's simple math. Yeah. Like with Michael Hyatt's company, we did their automation and brought them into HubSpot. We, simple problem. Simple problem is we get a ton of people that want to buy a journal, but don't actually buy a journal. That's a problem, right? So we yep. solve the problem. Yeah. By looking, using HubSpot, we use power of technology to say, show me every person because HubSpot has a pixel. Show me every person who's visited the journal page over the last month, yeah. but they haven't bought a journal in the last 90 days. So they visited our page. They wanted to buy a journal this month, mm -hmm. but they didn't in the last 90 days for some reason, whatever reason, because we had an integration to the e -com. So now all we do is we send those people an email with a nice offer to get them to buy a journal. Mm -hmm. 30K a month, boom. Simple problem, all right? Simple. We have another client that I did this with, aromatherapy. People go and they want to become a certified aromatherapist. They read the sales page to become a certified aromatherapist. A lot of people do that. Well, if we know their email address and we know they read the sales page, about an hour later, they get an email inviting them to a training to learn how to become a certified aromatherapist. That's simple, right? Like it's simple. It makes yeah. total sense. Now that works. We know it works because we see West Elm do it. We see Amazon do it. What we don't see is we don't see Lewis Howes, Jeff Walker, Michael Hyatt do it until I come in and take those same principles and bring them in and figure out how to make them work. Mm -hmm. it's, it, it's what I'm building in my brand is the 90s music industry. Explain what would that. happen? You would listen on Clubhouse live, right? So I'm on Clubhouse live. Mm -hmm. When you and I were growing up, I'm two years older than you. I turned 40 in a couple weeks. So oh, yeah. about two years older than you. So when you and I were growing up, you probably remember this too, but I would put my tape in and I would record whatever was on the radio. Yeah. Especially oh, the countdown. I, I DJ'd. I DJ'd. I'd have it on on pause record. You'd wait for them to hit the post because you don't want them hitting the post. You try to find that clean, you know, top seven at seven or top five yep. at five or whatever where they're not talking over everything. Yep. So 
right? I, I'm radio right now is that's Clubhouse. Clubhouse has said that we're terrestrial radio, we're live radio. So I'm live broadcasting on the radio whenever I'm live on Clubhouse. Mm -hmm. Well, what happens when you like your the seven at seven, you find the song you want, eventually you might just raise your hand and go to the music store and buy the CD for 20 bucks, right? Mm -hmm. Because you want better quality, you wanna to listen to it when you want to listen to it. Well, I take all of my Clubhouse rooms and I record them and they're available for $20 a month. That's my CD, that's my Spotify, that's my Netflix. It's all my stuff. You can listen live on the radio, come fall in love, come anytime I'm live, come listen for free, it's free, just go listen. Just like the radio when you and I were growing up. Mm -hmm. But if you wanna buy it, that's cool, you can buy it, it's 20 bucks a month. And then with some of our favorite musicians, we would want the experience with them, we'd wanna to go to the concert, we would want the backstage pass, so that's what I sell too. Yeah. You, you want to come to the, you want to rip the poster off the wall. <laughs> yeah. You want the poster. You want the autograph. You want the, you want to go to the concert. Like you want to go on summer camp with them, whatever it is. You want the experience with the band. Some people, the biggest fans would go to multiple concerts in the same year. Mm -hmm. Some of the biggest fans never missed a single concert. The information space in my world, based on all of my experience, is broken. It needs to be innovative. Right now, as an informational marketer, we're begging people to buy our products. Hmm. We're running launches and we're saying, hey, come buy, come buy, come buy, come buy. What we're not doing is building a brand big enough so when we launch something, we have a demand of people there waiting to buy. We're doing it backwards, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. We're saying, come buy, come buy, come buy, rather than just saying, hey, here's my free song. Here's my free song. Here's my free song. Oh, by the way, I have a concert. Boom, it's sold out. Right. So it's I'm the, trying it's the to Gary V. Yeah. Jab, jab, right? Give, give, ask, give, give, ask, give, give, ask. I'm just trying to build a little different than most people are building. Well, and, and you are. I mean, I think so um, you're reasonable approach your um even as you just explained it right like hey this is all i'm doing and buy and if you want to buy don't buy like like you even come you just you know you're good at sales man you know you're good at this like hey i'm offering it if you want to it's very enticing it's very intriguing i mean i'm i'm part of your discord thing i the sunday morning when you ran when you ran your your free training I was moving dirt in my, in my yard, right? I'm on a half acre. I had to regrade stuff. I'm literally in an excavator with my headphones on listening in because, and then jumping into a skid steer and moving dirt around and stuff and trying to like hear everything and <laughs> all of that stuff. Cause like, I don't want to miss a second of this stuff. And so, uh, you know, you are super innovative. Is this a secret? Is this, is this something that can be boiled down and taught or is this just you are that good at this? I don't know that answer, to be honest with you. Um, to me, it's easy. Like to me, it just comes natural. Yeah. But I don't know. It doesn't seem, it doesn't seem like fear or perfection slow you down or hold you back. No, it doesn't. It doesn't seem like you lack confidence in the ability to figure something out. And if it can't be figured out, you don't seem to wear that as some kind of like, oh, I didn't crack it or figure it out. It just is what it is. Um, you're very data driven. You're willing to jump into brand new things. Even a few weeks ago, you, you were talking about the fact that green room is, um, you know, uh, not secure because you were looking at the server on the back. And, and I was in that room and no one in that room even understood not only what you were saying, but no one even connected the dots for how you even got to the place where you were looking at the servers and the security in the background. So, so here, here's, here's what's really intriguing to me. Um, it's, you know, it's very clear. And I think a lot of your success is probably because you could sit down and talk about what you know, and people just go, oh, this is, this is cool. I don't really understand what you're saying, but you're excited by it. And if you're excited by it, I'm excited by it. And they buy into you. Like, like, they just buy into you so well. And so what I would love for us to all be able to figure out for everyone who's listening, for everyone who's watching, for all of the dreamers who are, we're turning into doers is like, how can we figure out how to capitalize on our own zone of genius to the level where we could have your level of confidence, your level of ability, your level of just, you know, you say that we all spend too much time trying to be like everyone else. You stand out because you don't waste any time trying to be like anyone else. 
I know what I'm really good at. I know what I really love. I know what we're doing right now. I would, I want to spend all day, every day doing. It's my lack of confidence in the ability to monetize and the ability to turn it into something real and the ability to stand out and the ability to make it more than just a hobby. That's, that's what slows so many people down. It's commitment mm -hmm. and trust in yourself. It's, you know, Mark, you're great at this. I watched some of your interviews before I came on today, but there's like, I was looking at some of your videos and they get a thousand views or something like that. Some of them more, some of them less, you know, but they're not, you're not getting a million views on each one. Not yet. Right. Not yet. And but you could, <laughs> right. You could, mm -hmm. if you went all in on it, mm -hmm. but what would you have to say no to? So I've got to look this up really quickly. And, and, and I know this is probably not the most professional thing in the world, but Glenn Lundy said something on his show one morning and it's right here. And I cried because he said, who loses when you don't win? Yeah. That quote. I, and I, and I, somebody else probably said it. It's probably not a Glenn Lundy no, no, quote. No, no. I heard Glenn say it. Yeah. But that quote hit me hard. Me too. Because if I don't win, who loses? So I can't not win. Yeah. Like, I can't not win. Like, if you want to go all in on your podcast, like, you can't not do it. Yeah. Like, if you're, I had to say no to every client, like every client, in order to give myself the space to say yes to me. Because you can't, right? Like, you can't be you when you're the part of its, its inner circle with Lewis Howes, but I'm the lead coach in inner circle. Well, I can't go be Gary because I'm, I'm under Lewis's brand and Lewis is amazing, but I didn't want to be under anybody's brand anymore. Okay. So like let's, you can't... let's talk about that moment. So, yeah. so you're, you're, you pitch Lewis to work with him. You get the opportunity and then you spend what, five years. I think you said you spend five yeah. years. 14 to 19. So 2014 to 2019. And when we're talking about working together, you've mentioned like, you know, you're sleeping on a sofa. You're at his place. You're building. Well, I've never out. been to. I've never been to his house. He's been to mine. Okay. He's been on my sofa. He's oh, okay. taking naps in my house. He's been <laughs> in my hot tub. He's. I've never ever been to Lewis's house. Really? So <laughs> Why? I have. But um, I don't know. I just I didn't go out to L.A. a lot. Ah, okay. Lewis would fly the team to my to Myrtle Beach to meet with me and my team. So okay. he would fly his team to me. Okay. So I don't know. So, so anyway, so, so you're working with him yeah. and you're building these things up, but there comes a point where, so I don't know if this overlaps with your divorce. I don't know if this overlaps with your kids moving to North Dakota and, and, you know, you relocating to the, to the Caribbean and all of these things. But it seemed like, it seemed like a lot of change where you had to say, I'm going to do these things to say no, as you mentioned, to free up space, to, to be able to own, like, I'm going to create freedom so that way I can finally, it can be Gary's turn rather than Gary, the one supporting and building everyone else. And not as much my turn. I, I was conditioned to believe false belief, right? We all have limiting beliefs and false beliefs that if I shine bright, my client, I couldn't shine bright like my clients. So I had to be dimmer than my clients. And, and that's just what I was conditioned to believe. Now, no client ever looked at me and said, you have to be dimmer than me. But like a couple of moments stick out on my head really big. So I asked Lewis one time to be a guest on his podcast. And his answer to me was go do something great. Now, in my mind, I was doing something great. I was his marketing person running the marketing for a big section of his company for many, many years. That's great. A lot of money coming in. But I was told, go do something great, which told me what I was doing for him wasn't great in his eyes. That's not his perception of great. So I just kept thinking, I was like, well, what's great? What's great? What's great? I went and spoke at Summit of Greatness in 2019. And, and I, I took a big role in the company that time. Like I had stepped up, I was leading all of the monthly calls for Inner Circle, which is his program that was created in South Carolina. Like all these calls I was leading him, Lewis would come in, I was the host, Lewis was the guest. You know, it, it was great. And I went and spoke at Inner Circle and it was great. Or I spoke at Summit of Greatness, packed house, everybody was there, packed house. And I said, I wanna be on the main stage next year. He said, kind of like, go do something great. Now I was backstage, I pitched the offer for him. He went on stage, made 300 grand in two hours golden offer. I gave him the pitch backstage. 
I want to be on stage, the main stage next year, because the main stage was Jesse Itzler, and he, that's where I wanted to be. I didn't want to be in the side stage teaching marketing. Like, I can do that, but give me the main stage. Let me tell stories. Let me, let me do this too. And I was told no. And I said, I'm not going to do it anymore. I'm not willing to grow someone else's brand at the sacrifice of my own. Mm -hmm. Because I, I deserve to be on the main stage. Now, it's his choice, and I respect his choice. It was his event. But that doesn't mean that I can't create the event in the next town on the next day and get myself on my own main stage. Because I know I should be there. And I knew that the longer I was working behind everyone else, I realized I wasn't the peer with these people. Like Brenda Burchard sent me a bunch of clients in the past. Like lots of these guys that I thought that I might be close to a peer level with, I wasn't close to a peer level. I was a vendor behind the scenes and a distant vendor. And that's not where I wanted to be because that's, that's, I don't want to be a vendor. What was it like to have that hit you? Or did you always know it and you just... I knew it. I mean, I knew that I've never played great in someone else's sandbox. Like, I'm just being real. <laughs> like, I, I play a little bit and I collab great. But someone taught me on Clubhouse early on. They said, you need to always stay warm with people. You get in trouble when you get too hot or you get too cold. I, I fuck up some and I go hot. <laughs> Like, I just, I get, I get too hot and I'm like, oh, let's go do this. Let's go do this. Let's go do this. Let's go do this. And then if they don't, I'm like, man, that's not a representation of my brand because I think they should be doing this. And I think we have a lot of opportunities. So then I kind of, I say, well, my brand, if I don't have a client that implements all the ideas, then my brand doesn't stand strong. So I said, I've got to be the best representation of that. I just got to go build for me. Like, I can't expect someone else to do what I'm not willing to do for myself. And that was, the, that was the epiphany, you know, you ask about moving and all this stuff. It was big epiphanies in my head is I have to be the best representation of what I want to show. So my son, last night I was on Discord. We talk on Discord. Um, and we were talking last night on a video chat. He told me, he said, Dad, I got a new Grand Theft Auto server. I said, you did? And he said, yeah. He said, you know, my friend, he was being bullied on the server. I said, oh, man, I'm sorry. He said, yeah, he's got a kind of high-pitched voice and all of his friends. My son's 13, and he said all the other people were making fun of him because he didn't have a, a deep enough voice. Mm -hmm. And he felt really bad, and he left. And my son had spent $70 on this server, like getting custom cars and all this stuff in Grand Theft Auto. He said, so I left too, Dad, but we found a new server out in California. We're going to go play on that one now. Like, that's why I did what I did, because that's what you do. That's like, that's how I want to raise my son is if somebody's getting bullied, if someone, if something's not right, you stand up for what's right, regardless of what that does to you. So that's just what I've done is I've just stood up for what's right. And I stood up for what I believe in all my life. So every time I go to make those decisions, I don't make them until I know what I believe in. I don't say this yeah. works until I know it works. Yeah. No, I've usually tested it. I've usually tried things. There's a lot of shit I do that nobody knows that happens. Just <laughs> testing to build my own confidence. Like I've got a fan page on Facebook with about 80,000 US based Tony Robbins fans. I just needed to see if I can milk them cheap. And I did like, like I'll go test and then I'll go do where I'll take one client and I'll say, Hey, one client, let's go try this. And then let me see if it works for you. And if it does now I can start to roll it out with other clients. Yeah. That's, um, I don't know what the word would be for it. You know, in, in terms of your son being able to say, let's go over here and do this in terms of you being able to put yourself first, most people don't or won't or, or feel selfish doing so. And I think that's what it is. I think that we, we as grownups spend so much time doing things out of obligation, doing things because we feel compelled to, um, out of, shame or love or respect or um, even on the, on the positive side of things, right? Out of honor and respect, but we just spend so much time doing things out of the way we should do it because we feel we should do it out of obligation or whatever it is. And we will do it for others. Your son will do it for his friend, which is remarkable that it cost him that, that he's willing to spend that to step out with his friend. Would he do it for himself? Would I do it for myself? Will most listeners do it for themselves? It sounds like you did it for yourself finally or maybe you always have you have to you know it's you you just have to you have to choose yourself because how can you expect anyone else to choose you if you don't choose yourself now i know i know there's a weird word that starts with the letter n that everyone uses around that narcissistic right 
It, it's oh, the really? Com- okay. <laughs> I was like, like, I was like where, which word is he going with? You? <laughs> <laughs> I was, when I went through my divorce, I was called a narcissist almost on a daily basis. Because what happens is if you choose you, then that to non-trained people, it's considered narcissistic. Yeah. Because you chose you. I went through a full psyche valve. I have zero narcissistic tendencies. Like I went yeah, through just, a full forensic psyche valve, so I can confidently choose me. And when they say you're a narcissist, I just get to look at them and give them, you know, I'm just like, nope, not a narcissist. No, I you're just proof. on the disagreeable scale. So part of your <laughs> yeah. personality is based on disagreeableness. You're comfortable yeah. being disagreeable. That's not narcissistic. You just don't mind being disagreeable. But I'm also comfortable just choosing me because I choose me. I do okay. it with my wife. I do it with you. Like I, I look at something and I'm like, eh, I'll do that. That sounds good because I want to do that. Or, yeah, nope, yeah. that doesn't sound good. I don't want to do that. Most people, like my wife, for example, Peyton, she feels a little guilty if our neighbors invite us some, to somewhere and we don't go. She's like, oh, we've got to go. They've invited us a couple times. We've got to go. I said, nope, I don't feel like going. I just don't want to go. Like, no is, is, is a sentence to me. It's the whole sentence. And it's like, no, I don't want to do that. Now, if you want me to go for you, then ask me. I'll do it for you because you're my wife and I love you. But I'm not doing that for me. I don't want to go with them that day. I might tomorrow. I might the next day. I, I think they're great people. It just may not be what I want to do that day. And so how does this get you into trouble, if at all? I mean, I have to imagine that the benefits well outweigh the costs. But with every, with every decision uh, is a cost, is a sacrifice. You know, you say no to free up space for this. So, so what, has this, what has this level of disagreeableness or even putting yourself first cost you? And... I hope you're going to say that it was, it's all well worth it. it. It is all well worth it, but it costs me a hell of a lot of friendships. Okay. Because I, I, I'm, I respect people, but I'm not really out looking for a ton of friends. And the friends that I bond with the closest are the friends that I build respectful relationships with. Hmm. That respect the, the professional boundaries and the personal boundaries and respect it all. So by choosing this stuff, I, I usually take the unpopular path. You know, I, I'm more by myself. I, I kind of do my own thing. I, you know, I don't like, I, I'm not a big planner. I kind of live in the moment, live by the day. I wake up and see what energy comes at me. So I miss a lot of that stuff. Um, I don't know. I grew up an only child. So I, I kind of enjoy my space doing my thing. Um, so I miss out on a lot of the, the bigger community aspects around it. But, you know, it's, it's okay. Like, I'm okay with that. I miss out on some of, the, some of the fun moments because I don't build, like, I don't prioritize, let me go build a close relationship with this amazing group of friends. I just have a different priority in my life right now. Like, I want to build friendships, and those are great. But my priority is let me go build the business. Let me go help people. There's, there's too many people that, that don't realize, like you, Mark, that you can do this and you can make a lot of money at it and you can just live your passion and be a creator. And there's I a want to so badly. You don't understand. <laughs> like, you don't understand the, the fear of uncertainty. The, the very thing where I, I said to my wife, I guess I could go out and get a job. Like it never crossed my mind. Like to me, it's like if, this, if I don't have a clear path and I'm not certain it's going to work, the opposite of that is like, devastation like you know i'm losing i'm losing everything and i'm gonna let everyone down and so it's just like this is the first time in my life where i'm stepping out in faith hoping that you know that in the next six months or nine months i'm gonna figure stuff out but let me tell you um I, I, you know, one of my favorite movies is Tangled. Now people could laugh at that. I love the movie Tangled, the Disney movie Rapunzel, because she lives that fear filled life. She lives that she has to step out of the tower. And there's the scenes, right? Where she first steps out and she's like, this is the greatest day ever. And then she's like, I'm a horrible daughter. And she's like, I'm never going back. Oh my goodness. I got to go back. And like a lot of us live there swinging between, between excitement and fear. And if you can't push through, if it doesn't work out, if you can't find that answer, if you can't live in optimism, um, you just end up going back, right? You just end up running back to the things that kind of worked in the past, even though you were maybe unhappy or trapped or whatever it is. And so you say, Mark, <laughs> it's good. I just, I, I trust you. I trust a bunch of books. I trust a bunch of people who have done it before, but my, my God, I'm, I'm just. You've got to trust yourself. Yeah. <laughs> like you've got to know, like 
I learned from Suzanne Evans one time. So she's a big mentor of mine. Mm -hmm. And she had on her wall, she was doing her book launch and we, we hit the New York Times bestseller list. It was great, but she had on her wall these bubbles and she had large, medium, and small. The large people were the people who had big lists, like over 50,000 people. The middle was the people who had the medium sized lists and the small were the people who had the small lists, email lists. We had a big goal at the top of the thing. We needed to get this many people, right? So we started calling. We started reaching out to all the people to get people to mail for us. We filled up the top, we filled up the bottom, we hit the big goal. You know what we didn't fill up? The middle. You know when we went home? When the middle was full. Because that's what it took to reach the goal. We knew the goal, let's just pretend the goal was 5 million. We added up, we had all the big ones. We were well over 5 million. We had a bunch of small ones, but we didn't fill in the middle. We sat down and we built our math and we said, we need this many, this many, and this many, because we know the bigger lists aren't gonna perform quite as good as the middle lists. But we didn't go home until we filled the middle. Mm -hmm. And that's what, when you sit down and you, you build your path and you, you look at it and you say, okay, here's how I'm gonna make money or here's how I'm gonna grow my audience. You've got to stick to the audience numbers. You've got to stick to like, I got to collar in all the bubbles. I got to do the steps, not just reach the goal. Because sometimes you can reach the goal a lot quicker. But if you don't do the steps, then you won't reach the goal again. Or you won't reach the bigger goal because you're reaching a micro goal. Mm -hmm. Like we knew if we sent 5 million emails, there was a chance we could hit the list. But we also knew we had to send to all those people too. We had to have all those individual relationships. John Lee Dumas, the same thing when he just launched his book. He told me, he said, Gary... Russell Brunson has the dream 100. He said, when I did my book, I built the dream 300. Hmm. And every single person on that list got a selfie video that was three to five minutes each from me personally asking them to do three key things. Everybody else would have done the dream 100, said, I did Russell Brunson's dream 100, check. John Lee Dumas did the dream 300, plus, plus, plus. And I mentioned him because you want to grow your podcast. You want to grow this creator space. And he just signed a really nice deal with HubSpot for his podcast in the seven figure tune. <laughs> so um, he's got a pretty popular podcast, mm -hmm. but he could have said, oh, I've got a popular podcast. Plenty of people buy my book. I've got a popular podcast. Surely, you know, or HubSpot's working to deal with me or this company's working to deal with me. But no, he still did the Dream 300 because he still needed to go sell the book. Mm -hmm. And I think it's those commitments to yourself. Like it's, and my friend Larry Kim, um, he owns Mobile Monkey now, mm -hmm. the Instagram. I don't know if you know Larry. Yep. But Larry's a good friend of mine. And he and I were talking one night and we were texting back and forth. And he said, you know, Gary, when I sell Mobile Monkey, I don't know that I won't do it again. Because if you know, like he sold WordStream for like $150 million. And now Mobile Monkey's number two. He said, Gary, I don't know that I wouldn't do it again. And we laugh because I have Gary coins. So, and we equate his stock and shares in Mobile Monkey to my coin and Gary coin. And he's a Gary coin holder. And like, we're, we're very close. We've known each other in the real world for like nine years now. But, um, <laughs> You know, he said, I don't know that I wouldn't do it again. And I don't know that I wouldn't either. It's like helping people getting, you know, figuring something new out. That's just what's fun to me. Yeah. So I just don't give up on myself and I can I have a path to make a little bit of money in the process. Yeah, I love it. Are you competitive? Are you like a competitive person or is it just oh, yeah. about the, hmm, that's interesting. I'm, I mean, so competitive, I'll tell you. That would you let, I, would you let your kid, like, so your 13 year old son, will you let him win a game or do you, or do you win and then say that, uh, you know, I'm teaching him a lesson? <laughs> no, I let him win if he beats me. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so and if I he wins, he him. wins. And if you win, you win. But I teach him how to beat me. Mm. That's, it's, I don't just beat him. I teach him how to beat me. Okay. If you do this, if you do that, if you do this, now he beats me. We play 2K, NBA 2K. Beats me all the time. Now he never used to beat me. Imagine if I would have just let him win. He would have never developed the skills to actually beat me. I love it. But I have a couple of clubs. You can see a little bit there. A couple of clubs in, in my clubhouse account. Yeah. And I look at the number of people live in those clubs. I always make sure mine's the number one. <laughs> right now I have 1,166 people live and what it takes to run a million dollar business has 1,018 people live. 
if I find times a day where I'm not winning, I need to go run rooms so I have more people live because that's all my competition. They don't give me enough metrics. So that's all I can do to look is see right now I have yeah, as I do, your 1,194 people live in Gary Club. Yeah. So I know that. So that's what I'm like. Those are like they're physically live on Clubhouse right now. So I know, man, I've got the most popular club out of all the clubs that I'm part of. That's what I watch. So am I competitive? I See, but here's where I'm different, though, Mark. I want every other club to crush it. Yes. I just want to I just want to to be the best. But and I want them to be better than me, so I have somebody. I'm pushing myself. But you're I'm very trying to find too, though, because I've heard you say that if that if if you do not succeed, then you know if you do not succeed, and Clubhouse does not succeed, and the things that you spend time and invest in do not succeed. So you need you need a lot of people to succeed for you to still stay on top. Um, and you know Clubhouse goes through these ups and downs week by week it seems people go from being like this is the greatest thing ever to it's dying and it's like come on we're like you know the time of this recording we're in july of 2021 relax <laughs> relax like either this is going to be a multi-year play or it's not right like can you imagine jumping off of instagram six months into it because you don't think it's going anywhere yeah exactly right i can't justin Liv do you know justin livingston uh, from Clubhouse, you mean, or real life? No, real life, Not Justin. Real life. Oh, no. So no. Justin and Callen, they built a company called Luminary Ventures. They grew to about $10 million in the coaching space. Big mm -hmm. run a couple years ago. Justin, one year, his goal for the entire year was to be the number one affiliate partner for Jeff Walker. Okay. His whole year, the whole goal. Because he knew in order for him to be the number one affiliate partner for Jeff Walker, everything else had to come true. He had to show up for himself. He had to grow the audience. He had to have the email list. He had to do the launch. He had to run the live event. He had to implement the strategy. Everything else had to come true. And Jeff was going to win in a big way, which he wanted to help Jeff win. So I find those people, my clients, my, you know, the people that I'm working with right now. And I say, how can I help them win in a big way? How do I go test something that they may not be willing to go test and figure out so I can figure it out and then I can help them win? And that's all I'm doing is how do I help you win? How do I help the next person win? How do I go figure out? I mean, you know, I got suspended from Clubhouse for a couple weeks or a couple of days, not a couple of weeks, a couple of days using a strategy very similar to one you use. Yeah, I was a little exactly was, the yeah. same as the strategy we use. We just don't sell anything. Yep, I was a little bit more aggressive in my marketing <laughs> language, um, but there's no rules. There's not a written set of rules like on Facebook that says you can't say the word crypto. You can't say this. I had to figure out what could you say? Yeah. What are you allowed to do? Because how can I tell you, Mark, I confidently think that your strategy works if I don't know if it works? Yeah. See, it's like, so interesting because I think, I think if we were to hand you our strategy, you would probably crack it pretty quick. You know, what we're looking at, so, so for anyone who, who doesn't know what we're talking about, my friend Evan Carmichael and I, we've been running for, gosh, two months now, daily rooms where we pull Evan's, some of Evan's top performing um, YouTube videos that are at least one hour long, up to five hours. Um, typically now we've learned that they have to be a certain type of person with a certain type of mindset, with a certain type of content, but we just run these 24 hour streams. We built out. We built out a full twenty-four hour seven mod squad that mods everything for us, and we're running these rooms. But we have a target we're looking to hit predictably, and there's nothing predictable. There is nothing predictable yet about what we're doing, and so it's just like we just keep going week after week, trying and testing small improvements. But there's no what I can see. There's no cause and effect. There's even with the data sets that we have, having run this for well over two months now. We're on week 13. We're on week 13 of our tests, running seven days a week for 13 weeks straight. And I can't figure out you want, how, how doing anything data. affects anything. I, don't, I can't figure it out. Like, wh what other industry would you be in running something 24 hours a day for 13 weeks straight, tracking everything and not be able to have any sense of what the heck is going on? It's, it's because Clubhouse is not like that. So what works on Clubhouse is what I've done for years. What works on Clubhouse is growing your share of voice. That's it. You can, like, Clubhouse is such a share of voice app, and it's where their new algorithms are leaning into. 
It's where everything else is going. Their clubhouse is building TikTok for audio, and TikTok's algorithm's insane. And they're building it in a way that no one's seeing right now. Mm -hmm. I, you know, Mark, I've done my biggest room with just me on stage. I hit 392 people before I brought anyone else up. Just me on stage myself, just talking. John Lee is implementing the same strategy. He hits 800. Mm -hmm. I have about 75,000 followers. He has about 350,000 followers. So what we found is the quicker we bring people up on stage, the quicker people leave the room. Mm. That used to work, right? It used to be like, let's stack the mods. Yeah, yeah, let's yeah. stack bring, the mods. Um, pair of people are talking about parachuting. Get them up. Get them down. All oh. of this stuff. And it sends little pings now. But what happens is when my audience comes in, they want to hear Gary Henderson speak. Yeah, so if Gary doesn't speak, Gary leaves. On stage, yeah. So that's where Clubhouse is evolving with their pinging engine. That's where they're evolving everywhere. So the strategy of running a 24-hour loop will grow a loyal audience, but you'll never build predictability in the algorithm. Mm -hmm. Because you're doing something the algorithm wasn't built to do. Right. So you're not going to get the flavor of the algorithm. You're going to get the people that say, and, and where I think you would actually do maybe a little better if you're not, is grab a text list or grab a private URL, maybe set up like evancarmichael.live and say, hey, every day, just go to evancarmichael.live and we'll redirect you to today's room. Anytime you want to listen, we're live. Just go here. Hmm. So they don't have to find you, right? They don't have mm -hmm. to find you in the feed. Now you can build out a little discord. <laughs> I'm gonna take. I'm gonna take a little note here. <laughs> <laughs> but that's my job. Like my job is to help you be successful because if you leave Clubhouse, and you go say Clubhouse doesn't work, I don't make money on Clubhouse. It's not worth the time. That hurts my brand. And this is where I was going with 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 the very selfish, selfless approach. And I've heard you say this on the room. So so you're authoring a book. You're writing a book that. That um, isn't, you know, it's it's picked up by a major publisher. You were paid in advance to write. It, I think it's called the Clubhouse Creator. Is that correct? Yes, it is. And it's going to come out in the fall of twenty one. Is is that correct? Yeah, it'll be out November twenty third, pending any changes. But right now, it's scheduled for November twenty third of this year. Which anyone who knows the publishing process is ridiculously quick. Ridiculously, typically, it takes six months to a year to write a book, and it takes uh, at least twelve to eighteen months for editing publishing, marketing, release, distribution, all of that stuff. So this is like the fact that from January to November, in a matter of 10 months that you're releasing a book is like really, really, really fast. But what I love about it is, um, is you are both very, very free with your advice, very free to say what you think and what you see you want to win, but you also need other people to win to not undermine your own win. And I don't think most people see it that way. And so that's why I was asking if you're competitive because, because um, I don't like to, to define myself too much with words, but I know myself, like I am not a competitive person. Like I'm just, I'm just not competitive. Like if it's you versus me and I look at you, I'll just go like, yeah, you'll win. Like, what's the point of playing? Like, <laughs> that's cool. Um, and I'm not that results focused, like from a numbers point of view. And nope. so I have all these friends who are entrepreneurs who are super competitive, super A type, super results focused. And I'm just like, cool. You know, like, and it just drives them crazy. They're like, Mark, come on. And I'm like, <laughs> what? Like, <laughs> and so I'm always hoping secretly I'll find someone else who's not competitive. Who's an entrepreneur who'll be like, well, Mark, here's the secret to getting shit done still. Um, but, but I love your coopetition approach, right? We have to cooperate. And at the same time, I'm going to crush you. <laughs> it's like, if we all, I don't, I don't even look at it as crush. I just look at it as like, if we all implement the same similar strategies at work, we all grow our own share of voice. We all just become us. We all just like Mark is Mark and Gary's Gary. And Mark has unique insights just as Gary has unique insights. And some people will want to spend more time with Mark than Gary and some people vice versa. And that's okay. Like that's just the way of the world. And if we just accept that, then we realize, well, the more Mark goes and becomes a creator and the more Gary goes and becomes a creator, the more we serve the generalized community of Clubhouse. Because when you open up the app right now, if you don't find something that interests you, you close the app. Mm -hmm. That's not the routine that any of us need, but nobody plays that game. Yeah. Nobody sees that game. Like, like I don't know if you do, but I do. Because oh, I no, know. It, it, it worries me. And so like, 
the people who are running the same rooms with the same titles every single day at the same time. It's like I, I ran a room this morning. Um, I think we had 34 people there. Yep. Hour and a half, amazing conversation. But I, you know, every so I, I run a room three days a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 10 a.m. for who knows how long, an hour, two hours, sometimes three or four hours, depending on the flavor. But it's a different topic every time. Um, I no longer have a mod squad show up. I just open up the room and I hope people will show up. And I have to create a topic that I can speak to, even if no one is there, yep. which actually trains me to be better. Yep. Um, I don't repeat topics, even though sometimes I feel like I probably should. Because <laughs> let me tell you, three times per week, brand new content that can be multiple hours when it's not Q&A based is very, very challenging. And on top of that, it's like it just forces me to create something that will keep people coming back or see it in the audience or stay curious. Because if all I ran was you know, Mark Monday, Mark Wednesday, Mark Friday, every time it's like, who wants to show up for that? Like who, who wants to come back the sixth week in a row and hear the same thing over and over again. It's just like, so I only get 40 people or 80 people or a hundred people in a row. Are you open to an idea? Always. So I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what I'm doing. I have the seven ways to make money on clubhouse. Yes. Seven simple ways, room sponsorships, coaching programs, done for you services, creator coins, monthly memberships, courses, and networking. And for anyone listening, you basically held up the back of a cocktail napkin. I mean, yeah, it's, it's a post-it note, but when you say I have this thing I'm doing, it's literally a post-it note. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's a post-it note. That's, I, I sat down one night. I, I keep this right here almost everywhere I go. It's a pen and paper. It's the big post-it notes. Yeah. And I sat down and I said, I need to teach something. Peyton was cleaning up the kitchen. So I wrote the seven ways to make money on Clubhouse. Mm -hmm. So I launch a room and I talk about it. Mm -hmm. But I always talk about this topic. Mm -hmm. Now I will launch this room 45 different ways. How to get room sponsors plus six other ways to make money on Clubhouse. Mm -hmm. Every time I launch it, I just take it a different direction. Mm -hmm. I can go on a monologue for 20 to 45 minutes and talk. I did that one time, got 400 people in the room. I can bring up people and be like, oh man, Mark's in the room. Mark, let's talk about networking and just start bringing you up and talk about one of my seven. I talk about the same thing. Yeah. Everyone knows in this season I'm in right now, Gary Henderson is talking about making money on Clubhouse. They don't get confused. Now I'm starting a regular room every Wednesday at two o'clock Eastern. Every single Wednesday, starting next week. I couldn't do it at this week. You and I had this scheduled. <laughs> but next week, this is my time slot. So running my type of room, my type of content, just like you would, the seven ways. They're big, broad containers that I can talk about. I don't have to mix those up. I can talk about them anytime. I can always talk about them. I can bring you in to talk about one of them. I can bring anybody in to talk about one of them. Doing that, now I feed the bigger show once a week. Hmm. Once a week, I'm going to do a fully produced interview style show right on Clubhouse. Mm -hmm. But the, 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 the tricky part is when these people find me, I want them off of Clubhouse consuming my other content. Yes. So I'm using Clubhouse as a distribution channel, a performance stage and a distribution channel. So I teach the same content over and over and over again because I know, because I have all the stats to prove it, that every time I run the content, I get a different audience. Mm -hmm. And every time I run the content in my containers, I get a different group of people that will come in and interact and engage. And if we're talking about making money on Clubhouse, you're gonna have a different story and a different set of questions than someone else. Yes. So I just always talk about the same thing. I don't produce content anymore. Hmm. Now I'll teach a little training here or there. Like I taught the other day how I got 1,640 DMs on Instagram in three days. I'm getting ready to run a room sometime over there. I have it. Um, we all effed ourselves. <laughs> Clubhouse colon we all effed ourselves. And I'm going to talk about how we all messed up the algorithms for ourselves, how we taught, we taught clubhouse, the wrong thing to do. We set up the wrong hierarchy and we did not leave space for the, the average creator on clubhouse like you to, to come in and, and get creative. Because like you said, Gary, you got started in January. You got the leg up on us. And I know yeah, a lot I, of creators right I now. Got, are it. I got very lucky. I'm going to be honest with you. I mean, you know, uh, I, I jumped on February 8th. And immediately I started running room five times per week, 10 a.m., five times per week. I did that until April. Mm -hmm. So all through February and all through March, just like struggling, just painful. And I did this with the help of Evan and some of his pull. 
Um, but it was really when we started running these streams and we started getting passive followers and I started building um, a little bit of a name for myself and I started going into other people's rooms. So yep. in April we did that, but like if you, if I, I track my numbers, but middle of April, I was at 600 followers, I think. Wow. And now, so, so from February <laughs> wow. 8th to middle of April, going every single day, I picked up 600 followers. Now, for anyone who doesn't know Clubhouse, here's the difference. Gary jumped on December 24th. Now, you went 24-7. You went with John Lee. You certainly went more all in than I ever did. I just did five, five times per week and, and, and this and that. But, um, you know, I, Nick Bradley, a good friend of mine now that I met through, you know, he's at 50,000 followers. Yep. Um, and he does a room once a week and he's part of a few other things. So this is where it's like, I worked for months to get 600 followers. <laughs> you guys are at like 50,000. Now I'm at, I think I'm at 7,300 today or 7,400 today or something. Cause, cause we're doing this strategy and it goes up all the time, yep. um, which is great. But it was really when I cracked 3000 that people started taking me more seriously. And, and that sucks. And that is the gap. Right. And so I, one feel very fortunate that, um, you know, that probably by the end of the month, I'll be at like 10 or 12,000 people. I feel very fortunate that actually right now, I kind of feel like I'm one of the fastest growing people on the app, yeah. simply because I'm looking at other people's numbers and people who are at 22,000 in March are at 22,000 still. Yep. People who are at 36,000 are at 36,000 still. Right. Um, Grant is growing quickly, never mind. Grant went from 600,000 to 606 in like a day. But um, I feel very fortunate and very lucky. And at the same time, um, this is one of the first times, you know, again, with Evan's help, with a ton of effort, with a ton of support, I'm putting a ton of focus, time, and money into it. Uh, I'm kind of flirting with one of the hacks that you spend all day, every day doing, right? Like, this is just your life. Your life is like, how can I find that opportunity? How can I make the most of it? And if it's not something, I throw it away. And if it's something, I keep going. Um, and, and that is really interesting. It's really interesting because it, it feels like cheating to me still. You know, I go into Steve's room and Steve Osler, Osler would yep. say like, like everyone who's up on stage, every single one of these people earned this the followers one person at a time. And then, and then I'll go, except for Mark, <laughs> you know, I'm like, yeah, well, I'm trying things. Here we go. So. <laughs> And I think you earn them because I think you're innovating and I think it takes consistency. And what you're doing to me is you're reserving your voice for that room because you can't go in two rooms at the same time. Mm -hmm. So you're sacrificing your voice to go and do that mm -hmm. choice. And, and, you know, you grow some followers and, and I think you earn them. Like yeah. I don't like, I don't know. I look at it and like, I have known Steve and I know all these guys, like we go way back and I just look at it and I'm like, man, as long as like, here's what I tell people. If you're winning, I don't care what you do. If you're losing, come, come find me. I'll help you. <laughs> like, that's it. Like if you've got a strategy that you think is working for you on clubhouse, I I'll have five you. I may not use your strategy, but great. Go for it. I'm excited. But it's when you say it doesn't work, when you say it's not working for me, you need to find me because I want to help you before you leave. Like, that's just that it's just that simple. Like it can work for everyone, but we have this weird camp that I'm trying to shift right now, yeah. which is creating space for the new creator, the evolving creator, the person who's I, really emerging. Like they've never been in, they've never really had a, they've had a business maybe, but they've been a hey, consultant. Like they've here, been a consultant. Here I am, right? Like, Basically, I, I think I'm really the prototype. I mean, I started my company in 2006, 15 years. Yes, I've podcasted for a long time, but nope. never built the numbers, never nope. built the email list, never built the following. Even now, have no monetization tied in. You go to my IG, I have 1,600 followers, and half of those came from Clubhouse. We don't have proper systems. We don't have proper processes. I'm literally like, like the reason I gravitate towards your message and I learn so much from you is because, honestly, when I came on the app, I did not realize that I would have to hack, I would have to hack my way to even hit a level that other people could ha were able to hit just by being on a few months earlier. Yeah. And, um, and if I didn't figure this out, I probably would have given up already. And that's unfortunate for a lot of other people when there's 20 million plus people on the app, when we are only 
a year into something that theoretically will be going for very many, a lot of years in the future. Um, I'm only doing this now because if I'm here and I'm learning, you know, in the darkness and I'm learning before everyone comes, I'm, I'm, I'm building something now when it opens up, when the population shows up, we're going to have to bob and weave. We're going to have to change. It's going to change everything about it. But at the same time, I'll feel like at least I've developed the skill set early right. and, and that's it. That's, I just see this as, as training, a training day. It's just a training period. And for, for when the real stuff happens, maybe that's not the way to look at it, but that's what gets me. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's what gets so me through sometimes. <laughs> one little tweak for you can grow your Instagram overnight. Just ask people to send you a direct message and you'll send them back the link to the training you're playing. Yes, I just got, I just got accepted for Mobile Monkey yeah, yesterday. Like yesterday, I will... was at, I was at with the amusement park with my friends, and suddenly no. Mobile Monkey started shooting out, "Welcome, hey, no. buddy!" I'm like, I'm like, uh, I don't know what's happening. <laughs> <laughs> but like, that's what you got to do because then you'll just grow your Instagram. Now you're not growing on platform because yeah. that's what you don't want. Yeah, you yeah. don't want to grow. You need to grow on platform, but you want to grow an audience and a brand that will go with you. They'll come to your podcast and listen. So you could put a little cue or a little call to action there that says, if you want this training plus X amount of other training, send me a message. What are you going to get? You're going to get direct messages where you can start saying, here's the one we're listening to from Evan. And here's all of my podcasts. Here's all my videos. Here's everything else of mine. Now you're taking all these hundreds or thousands of people coming through your clubhouse room, pushing them to your YouTube channel, pushing them to your podcast, pushing them to your website, just moving the energy. Now you have a distribution channel there mm -hmm. because you're not growing, you're growing on platform, but you're growing an audience of people that you're moving into places where you shine better. Now you're moving the energy, right? So people, they're like, oh, I see Mark's face. I hear Mark's voice. I hear this. I hear that. Now they're starting to really get to know you. Yeah. Like that's it. That's it's, it's little bitty simple tweaks to say, Oh, I'm, I'm building a relationship on clubhouse. How do I move them off? How do I get them to Instagram? How do I get them to my podcast? How do I get them onto a zoom? How do I get them over here? How do I move the energy with them? And then we'll drop, people will drop in every one of those processes. But the bigger we grow in the distribution channels, the more opportunity we have in the community or, or wherever you house the, the masses. Yeah. The Facebook group. I use discord, you know, whatever you do, but that's where you really build that, that, that support group. I love it. I love it. Gary. Oh man. I could talk. I mean, this is, <laughs> we could just talk all day. We won't, but we could. Um, let me ask you, and this is typically how I close off for you at the end of the day, what does it all come down to? <sighs> That's a tough one. Um, a couple of things. I think, I think it's, helping people realize that there's a path that doesn't include the traditional path and that at the end of the day, success is about having freedom and choice, not about anyone else, whether it be a client or an employer or a wife or anyone else telling us what to do. We should get to choose to do it because we want to do it. And, and that freedom is what I drive for. And it's what I think everybody else should have. You can't get it if you don't have financial freedom. You can't get it if you don't trust in yourself because you won't give yourself the freedom to allow for it to happen. So that's, and, and it's something I'm striving for every day. And it's something that I see like, like so many people talk about, like my mom that was a school teacher and raised me and, and I hear her talk and she's like, oh, I've got a little of your Gary coin and it made me a little bit of extra money. I want to take it back out now. I'm like, but just let it ride mom. And she's like, but I've never dealt with this much money. I've never dealt with that before. I don't, I don't understand that. You know, I just dealt with all that in my life, and I, I think people need to know that there's a different path, and there's a choice, and there's a freedom, and it's it's relatively achievable. Like, it's not that hard to make a couple grand a month, or five or six or seven grand a month. It's not that hard, and then you have a path to freedom if you choose to take it, or you just make a couple grand a month and, and, and live ever how you want to live. That's okay, too, but it doesn't have to be working for someone else, and, and that's just a big mission that I'm on that I, I want to share with the world, so that's what I keep striving for every day, helping more people accomplish their own whatever their own version of freedom looks like i'm gonna be honest with you i love gary's direct yet totally understanding and reasonable approach to business and to life and he's actually been a really big influence on me so thank you so much gary henderson
Okay, the three takeaways from this conversation. Number one, to make room for you, like your visions, your creativity, your strategies, your voice, your personal brand, you. You need to put yourself first. It's, it's so simple, right? Because it's really hard to give your creative spirit and all of your creative energy to everyone else while also being able to carve out space for you. Often, most of us put other people first and we only give ourselves the leftovers. It's not good enough. Lesson two, okay, get comfortable choosing yourself. You can't expect anyone else to choose you if you don't choose yourself first. And of course, lesson number three, see crazy fast results. You have to go all in and commit. Of course, it's gonna come with some risks. You may lose some people along the way. You may have to make some sacrifices, but the question you need to ask yourself is, if you don't win, who loses? Now, if you have something to prove to the doubters, to the haters, to that little voice of fear that screams at you from the back of your own mind, if that's you, you've got to face the difficult and the scary and the hard things in your life. It's not easy. It's never easy. But remember, we, we're not just dreamers, we're doers, because we do hard things. If you ever felt like you're not good enough, like you weren't born with the right skills or gifts, like you just don't have what you need to get ahead, you've got to hear how this author breaks down everything we thought we knew about personalities and limiting beliefs. Click on the video right over there to hear this real, inspiring conversation.